Hey everyone and welcome back to another World of Warcraft Legion video. Today we're going to be covering a Q&A session with Associate Game Director Ian Hazakostas. Basically Blizzard are doing a series of community Q&A sessions every Thursday on Twitch.tv. This week was a general Q&A but there are further ones planned for professions, PvP and other topics. They seem to indicate this is a format they would like to do more and that this is a bit of a test. Now, Blizzard is somewhat known for being a little bit closed off as far as community interaction goes in comparison to some other companies, so it's great to see a push towards that interaction and hopefully that continues into the future. Now, my plan for these is to condense all the information down into one video that's nice and concise, tells you what you need to know in a simple and fast manner, so let's get right into it with Ian's comments on the content drought. He said that, frankly, actions speak louder than words, and there are many times where he himself said, we don't want a content drought, and then a content drought has happened. He did say that avoiding it is a priority now, and that when setting out to create Legion, they wanted to solve the content drought problem by making expansions come out faster, but what they discovered is that it just takes a certain amount of time to deliver a quality expansion and that they were too ambitious with their projected timeline. He said their approach now, when working on the expansion after Legion, is to ensure that Legion is well supported and to accept the amount of time that it just does take to build an expansion, so they shouldn't be caught with their pants down for basically 14 months, as has happened two times in a row. That was absolutely great to see, and uh, again, you know, it's, it's a good admission of the problems that have happened. As Ian himself said, though, actions will speak louder than words. He did say that the one expansion per year plan would not be the best thing for the players of the game, and he even alluded to some of the things that I remember complaining about with Warlords of Draenor, where they just weren't making use of the world that they created. They had so many things like uh, Shatrath and, uh, you know, Bladespire and Caraborn, they didn't make that much use of any of them past one or two, you know, instances, and you never really revisited them. So we talked just that, you know, if, if they allow the expansion to last a bit longer and live a bit longer, they can really make use of the content and the world that they actually create. And of course, that not doing one expansion per year is just a recognition of the amount of time that it takes to create a satisfying expansion rather than what is essentially just a glorified content patch. Speaking of content patches, let's talk about Thaldranath. This is a part of the Broken Isles map that, uh, well, it was a part of the Broken Isles map. It was removed from the map very soon into the testing process. Ian said that it was going to be yet another elven island that had a legion presence, and they have since scrapped it as an idea because they've had a better idea that they think will be more fun, which I think is a completely valid reason, and given what they've said about how many patches they want to deliver with legion, I don't think this is a Farallon styled situation at all. Next, let's talk about personal loot. This is a really good feature um, announcement that they've sort of made. So he said that players like the social element of passing loot around, and they're updating personal loot to mean that this is possible. In Legion, if you get a drop that is a lower item level than what you currently have for that slot, it will be tradable. Same goes for like if it's a dupe or something. Basically, if you're in that situation where you have a crap uh, piece of gear, somebody else has just got something for that slot, but it's not that useful for them, you know, rather than them vendoring that or disenchanting that, they can just give it to you. And I think that's a really good feature that drastically improves the personal loot system. So that's definitely great to hear. Next, let's hop on to a topic that's a bit more controversial, and that is randomness. Ian said that they hear the concern with RNG, but he brought up the opposite of it, i.e. a wholly deterministic system that's 100% certain. He said that that would be quite grindy, whereas RNG systems allow for a lot more surprise and excitement and all that jazz. Now, I think that his response to it was maybe a little bit pointless because he didn't acknowledge that there was a happy middle ground between the two, and I, I think there are more things that could have been talked about there. Uh, he also only covered the downsides of a determinic, uh, deterministic system and the upsides of an RNG system, so it wasn't a particularly balanced answer. I'd really love to see a developer session similar to what uh, Jeff Kaplan has done with some of the Overwatch stuff, where they just dive into that issue, or even Ben Brode for the Hearthstone stuff. Now, he did acknowledge that the randomness didn't work out for the PvP in Warlords of Draenor, but he did talk about how normalized stats in the Legion PvP system make most of it a non-issue, and uh, when you actually put it all down on paper, he is right. So it's not a massive problem for PvP, I just think it's a bit of a pain in the butt currently. 
Next, let's talk about Suramar. So Ian said that Suramar will have content added to it throughout Legion. Suramar is an endgame zone with a super heavy narrative focus. He said that looking back at Warlords of Draenor, there was a whole bunch of potential that they never followed up on and that they've resolved to not do that again. So basically what he alluded to here is the idea of a content patch adding stuff, narrative stuff, to a zone that was already in the game. This would be the equivalent of a content patch coming out for Warlords of Draenor that maybe gave you something new to do in Shatrath City or um, new to do in Karabor. So it's good to see that they intend to use the locations that they create a bit more in the content patches. Though once again, actions speak louder than words, so we will have to wait and see. Next, let's quickly touch on the topic of healer leveling. So they have put thought into increasing healer damage and capability when they're leveling up. They've seen that it's better than before, and overall, in the grand scheme of things, they're quite happy with how the healers are performing. Their goal, according to Ian, is not to have the combat times of healers to be equal to DPS when leveling. Obviously, that would make DPS kind of pointless, but what they do want is to get away from the idea of healers taking two or three times longer to kill a mob, and that even if a healer takes long, a bit longer to kill a mob, they make up for that in that they have a lot less downtime or you know various things like that. In my experience of Legion, it has been nicer to level up as a healer. Overall, and Ian even admitted this, it is still faster to level up as a DPS, and I think that's definitely the better way of doing things. But if you really want to level up as a healer, then you absolutely can do that. Especially when it comes to your talent build, you generally do have the ability to take a few talents, which will increase the DPS throughput of your healing spec by a decent enough margin. Next, let's quickly talk about talent uh, switching. So he added that you basically get a preparation aura whenever you enter a dungeon, and that will allow you to change your talent. So basically, you can quest in your questing talents, then you're queued for a dungeon, the dungeon pops, you go in, and you have an opportunity to change into your dungeon talents um, you know, from your questing one. So that takes away one of the concerns of the talent swapping system. Um, if you want to check out my video on that, then it's on the channel. I think it's worth a listen, but it's nice to hear him uh, talk about that system. Next up, bind on pickup crafting materials. So currently people are a bit worried about the equivalent of Savage Bloods being BOP only. It boils down to Blizzard wanting professions to be more gameplay focused for individuals. So the idea of you being a blacksmith who goes out and mines some stuff. Essentially, it seems like they want to uh, to shift away from facilitating kind of goblin players. So the people who, you know, all they do is craft, they're, um, you know, farming up, or not farming up, they're purchasing massive quantities, you know, they're of materials, they're mass producing items. Really, you know, the people who are applying like proper economics and really going at it with their profession gameplay. Now, that's actually the kind of profession content that I enjoy. I would like to be able to purchase Savage Bloods. I feel that if somebody is a crafter or anyone, uh, whatever they're doing, and they get a Savage Blood, I think that for those people, if they don't do professions, that Savage Blood isn't that useful. Um, I would rather that that person have the option to sell that Savage Blood to me so they could get some of my money, and that I could then, in turn, use that Savage Blood to build something to sell to another player. I think that creates a more dynamic economy. I kind of get where Blizzard are, go are coming from here, but for the same reason that I did not enjoy bind and equipped, or sorry, a bind on pickup uh, modes of harmony in Pandaria, I don't think I'm going to enjoy these Savage Bloods. Next, let's talk about targeting the legendary items. This is a very interesting topic because initially they did reference you being able to target getting a certain legendary drop. Well, he said that the legendaries are random at their core and they're supposed to recapture the feel of vanilla-style world quests. They will have systems that will increase your chances of getting a drop over time, so that's some bad luck protection there. You will not be able to target legendaries at launch, but in the future they might add that functionality. He basically said that at a later point in the expansion, the gameplay is going to shift from merely owning a legendary towards targeting the legendaries or, you know, combination of legendaries that you want to facilitate the gameplay that you're really interested in doing. Next, let's talk about dungeon sets. There are no dungeon sets in Legion, similar to the, you know, the dungeon sets of Legion, or not Legion, um, Vanilla as an example. Ian said that they look back on those dungeon sets fondly and that they might do it later, he did say that you currently have a set through your class order hall that fills a similar niche. However, the requirements for each piece of that set actually do vary. Some of them are reps, some of them are dungeons. Basically, it fills a similar niche. It's just unlocked by doing a range of content at max level. 
Honestly, I wouldn't mind having both. I think dungeon sets are really cool. I think they're a, a particularly nice, um, you know, reward to shoot for. So it's a pity that they're not in, and hopefully should they add new dungeons or something like that in a future patch or even a future expansion, the dungeon sets would be um, a feature um, of whatever they add. Next, the legendary ring of Warlords of Draenor. Um, well, its proc is going to decrease in power as you approach max level. It's not designed to last you all the way through, like, doing Legion Dungeons at max level, so that proc will be decreased. However, it still does have its high item level. Additionally, their plans to remove the Legendary Quest of Warlords are the exact same as with Mists of Pandaria. You won't be able to begin the quest after the pre-patch, and you won't be able to finish the quest once Legion launches. So, if you want that ring, you better get started now, and uh, I'm, I, I haven't done enough Hellfire Citadel to have the, the yellow or the, the book things you need to get, so I should probably do that. Uh, yeah, I basically haven't played Warlords of Draenor since last July. I completely lost interest uh, right about the time that my guild fell apart, so yeah, I will have to do some Oh dear, I guess I'm LFR to get those. Anyway, let's move on to pristine servers. He said they floated the idea of pristine servers knowing that it wasn't really targeted at the core group of players who wanted legacy servers um, and that the idea of the pristine servers was just more trying to see what people thought about getting the old school social aspects of WoW into the game. If you're not aware of the pristine servers, it was just the idea of spinning off a WoW server that was the same content as the, the most recent version of the game, but with no dungeon um, LFG or systems like that. And um, so there was all sort of manual and social in terms of people coming together and like no cross realm stuff. Now, he said that right now they're focusing on the current game and that they learned a lot from that discussion and the pristine servers are not a thing to expect, which I think makes sense as much as there are some upsides and cool bits of the pristine servers. I don't really think it's something that's uh, worth bothering with. I'd rather any efforts went towards maybe doing the legacy servers. Anyway, alts in Legion. That's a big topic people have been wondering about. Ian said that Legion is very alt-friendly in terms of the diversity of content, with there being your artifact quests and, you know, the storylines associated with that, the class order hall campaigns. So there's a lot of unique content for each class, I absolutely agree, but... There are only four leveling zones, and every character will have to do all of them, so the lion's share of the amount of leveling time will be the exact same, uh, with really no way of doing it uh, that differently overall. Yes, you can do zones in a different order, but does that matter when you're going to be doing the same stuff eventually anyway? Now, we also did talk about artifact power and alts. So you can increase the multiplier on the artifact power that you gain by researching artifact knowledge in your order hall. By default, that research might take five days per level of research that you do. But as time goes on with the expansion, they will be decreasing that research time so that alts will be able to catch up on their artifact power faster and faster as time goes on. The artifact knowledge that you have on your character will also apply to every single spec, so it will make powering up your secondary spec's artifact weapon quite fast. Each progressive trait with your artifact weapon also costs more and more artifact power. So, as an example, going from, uh, say, 20 traits to 21 traits on your main spec's weapon might use enough power to buy, say, 5 traits for your off-spec one. So basically keeping a second spec at like 80% of your main spec artifact weapons power should be quite easy. Um, and their intent there is to allow the um, the playing of multiple specs to be something that's very viable. A lot of that kind of feels contrived. Um, we'll just have to see how well they manage to communicate all of that to players when Legion launches. Next, let's talk about Valor. There are no plans for Valor, but they maybe can see it coming back for the end of Legion. Right now, they don't want to have upgrades or anything like that complicate choices and lessen progression during an expansion's tier-to-tier -tier progression, which I do agree with, but come on, Valor points, you can do other things with them. I would like some sort of Valor gear to be back, it can, you know, be a safety net, whatever, that accompanies the current, uh, you know, RNG gear that they have so much of in Legion, but hey, that's just what I personally think, and they quite clearly disagree, and as much as all of us YouTubery people talk about RNG, I don't really know if we're going to be able to get them to step back on us. Next, time walking. So he did confirm the time walking and the weekly events will continue. He apologized that uh, Apexis quests and Apexis crystals don't exist in Legion, so that category will unfortunately be cut. 
Very sad. But there is a replacement, which will increase, I believe, the reputation that you get from doing world quests. Anyway, all those things will be on hiatus during the launch of Legion, but will return about a month after the expansion's launch. Next, at the stat squish. So, um, he said the numbers are on the large side currently, and that the next expansion will have a stat squish. However, those stat squishes are a band-aid, and in the next expansion, they want to look at how they can make their combat system uh, be a little bit more elegant as far as all these numbers go, so they don't need to constantly do these squishes. I absolutely think that would be a very good thing for them to do. Next up, Titan Forging. All gear has the potential to be Titan Forged, which is the same as War Forged. Basically, they like how this means more content is more relevant for longer, and this is something that I maybe should have given more thought to previously because Ian does make a good point here. So it used to be that you would stop doing a type of content once you had a higher item level. Well, in Legion, almost all gear can be a much higher item level than it normally would be, albeit with the really high item level procs being extremely rare. Now, this means that even if you raid, you'll have a reason to go back into dungeons and to do world content. Now, as somebody who fast ran into the problem in Warlords where you were raiding two nights a week and had literally nothing uh, that was super interesting to your progression to do in between then, well, that's not really the case here, right? You can always be working on something. Now, could that be more grindy? Yes. Um, are there sort of retention things in there? Yes. But if you think about it, you can take the cynical view of, uh, you know, retention is just a way to keep people strung on for longer. But then there's also the view that the more people are retained, the more they're actually playing and engaging with your game and enjoying it. That's, I guess, a, a fine balance to walk. I still have lots of concerns with how this system works. Um, I really just want to be able to play through it to get my, my full on opinions uh, on the live version of the game where all the upgrades matter. But yeah, suffice to say, I'm a little bit worried, but he does make a good point there, so fair enough. And finally, I'm just going to cap this video off with flying, everyone's favorite topic. So without going into details, he said that flying will be unlocked roughly midway through Legion, and that you can work on the achievement that unlocks flying from launch. And they previously did say that you will be able to get like 80% of the way to unlocking flying at launch. So once they, um, you know, once they issue a patch which unlock or allows you to unlock flying, uh, it should be pretty quick from when that patch comes out to when you can actually finish the achievement and fly about the place. And that's pretty much it for all the important stuff. There were one or two things about beta balance, which I just didn't think were particularly important because that's all in flux anyway. But that's pretty much the long and short of it. It's nice to see they're doing more community stuff like this. I certainly hope they continue to do more of that in the future. But that's it for me. If you've got any um, further comments, hit me up on Twitter or drop them down in the comments of this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.